Net Wealth Investments Limited is licensed to provide general advice. Our podcasts are not tailored to any one financial situation and may contain views of our presenters which may not align with Net Wealth's. The guests, organization, and Net Wealth have an arrangement for their financial products to be available for investment through the Net Wealth platforms, and Net Wealth may receive fees from the guest. More information about Net Wealth can be found on our website, including our financial services guide and disclosure documents. Please seek professional advice before acting. Welcome to the Net Wealth Portfolio Construction Podcast, brought to you by the Net Wealth Investment Research Team. In this podcast series, we pick the brains of key wealth management professionals to uncover opportunities and challenges for investors on a diverse range of topics. We hope you enjoy their unique perspectives. To the Net Wealth Portfolio Construction Podcast Series. My name is Paul O'Connor and I'm the Head of Investment Management and Research for Net Wealth Investments. Today we welcome back Roger Montgomery, who's the Chairman and Chief Investment Officer of Montgomery Investment Management. Welcome back, Roger. Great to be with you again, Paul. Roger is the founder of Montgomery Investment Management and brings more than two decades of investment and financial market experience, knowledge and relationships to bear in his role as Chief Investment Officer. Montgomery was established 2010 and is a specialist Australian equities boutique that employs six full-time professional investors. Montgomery expanded its investment offering by launching two separately resourced global equity strategies in July 2015. The investment strategies offered a high conviction and employer-style neutral investment approach. Prior to establishing Montgomery, Roger held positions at Ord Minute Fleming, BT Australia and Merrill Lynch, and in 2010 published his first book, the best-selling investment title, Valuable. Both global and Australian equities markets experienced a significant sell-off in March and April last year, but the subsequent bounce back in the second quarter was nothing short of extraordinary, and over the last 12 months, the S&P 300 index has returned about a negative 2.7%, which I guess given all the bad news and what has gone on on over the last 12 months, we'd have to consider reasonable. However, no matter how you value a company, share prices appear to remain at very high levels, particularly the prices of many companies that aren't making any profit or paying any dividends. So I'll certainly be interested to hear Roger's views on the market volatility in 2010, what he thinks about current valuations, and if there are still any investment opportunities on the horizon over the short term. Roger, a lot's happened both personally and professionally since we last caught up in February last year. So how did the business go adjusting to the onset of COVID and I guess most of your staff having to work from home? It was all fairly seamless for us, Paul. um, We feel like we, we were luxuriating in our isolation because you know, we weren't required to drive a bus. We weren't required to down tools. We, you know, we just we just went on our way. So we were incredibly fortunate. We didn't suffer any of the, uh, I guess, the the pains or the the you know the adjustments that were required by many other industries. We, we didn't experience what the retailers experienced, for example, and property, uh, you know, property centre owners experienced. Um, so we were able to really fly along undisturbed, uh, observing how everyone else was uh, experiencing the crisis. We're also very fortunate that I came back, I went on a ski trip. I'd been in Japan, first time ever that I'd skied overseas. And um, the family and I, we came back, it was the 26th of January, 2020. And we were wearing masks on the plane because there'd been some COVID cases reported in Tokyo. But we were the only people wearing masks on the plane and my kids were really getting stuck into me about forcing them to wear masks when nobody else on the plane was. Now, the reason I tell you that story is that we were convinced it was a serious issue. And when we got back, when we all got back to the office, uh, one of the things that we immediately did was we set up a project to track the uh, testing rates around the world. So everyone else there was a lot of tracking going on of uh, cases. There was a lot of ca- there was a lot of tracking of deaths, but we didn't see many people tracking testing. And what we knew that if you don't test, you don't find. Uh, and so the US was looking pretty safe, but what we found out through our um, research was that in January of 2020, 
the US, now remember the US has a population of about 335 million people. They were testing, and I kid you not, Paul, they were testing 40 people per day on average in January. And they were testing, this is all of their pathology centres, uh, private and public. Uh, so the CDC centres as well as the private centres, we were tracking them all. And then in February, they were testing. Remember, in February is when the virus jumped from Wuhan to South Korea and to Italy. Uh, and they were testing in the United States. Again, nothing to see here, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, they were testing 92 people per day on average. Wow. Yeah. So, so, at a 300, so we knew that there was a crisis coming. And as soon as the US admitted enough to start testing, they would find very, very high infection rates, primarily because, because they weren't testing, they didn't know how serious the problem was and they were letting it spread. Uh, and, uh, and, and even when they knew how bit bad the problem was, they let it spread anyway. But, but we knew that that was going to be a surprise to the market. And so what we did in the small companies fund, we moved to about 40% cash uh, in February. And then in the Montgomery Fund and the Montgomery Private Fund, we moved to between 33 and 37% cash. So we really did sidestep, uh, um, quite fortunately, uh, the, um, the the worst of the sell-off in the Australian market. Yeah, interesting uh, your comments there, Roger, because I think similar comments have been made about Indonesia. I remember they were one of the countries that had one of the lowest, I think, incidents of COVID per capita, but they also had the lowest testing in the world around March, April last year. So, yeah, it's it's, it's certainly interesting there. But I'm guessing that would have, that would have been the highest cash levels you've held in the funds since inception. Yes. Yeah. Well, certainly for the small companies fund, that's right. You know, and now we're back to less than, well, less than 10%, in some cases, less than 5% uh, cash. You know, we're back to fully invested. Yeah, well, I guess it also highlights the value of a strategy that has some flexibility to be able to go to cash because a lot of your peers obviously are, um, are fully invested and they're, um, they're stuck invested in the market if, um, yeah, if they feel that there's going to be a significant, you know, impact that will cause a, a down a downflow prices but um yeah it's been an amazing 12 months yeah it sure has uh, look the reality is being able to correctly pick when to go to cash and when to go into shares you know i think that's a fool's game i think long term you want to be fully invested um and as we'll as we'll no doubt explore in this podcast uh you know there are there are plenty of opportunities to make money in the market most of the time mm. all right well moving on to uh, the questions we've got for you today there, Roger. Um, from an economic perspective, the outlook for 2021 appears to point to a strong economic recovery based on some return to normality due to the vaccine developments. So what's your view on the outlook for the Australian economy this year? Yeah, I think I think we're in a really good place thanks to some, some really wise economic management, um, particularly JobKeeper. Uh, you know, I think that's really helped our economy. There was a lot of fear about what might happen at the end of JobKeeper in March uh, this year. A lot of that fear has dissipated. Um, and, uh, and, you know, I think what we'll see is a continuation of JobKeeper in a more targeted form. Uh, so the broad-based JobKeeper will end. Uh, and, you know, you might see something supporting the tourism sector, for example, or something supporting the arts. Uh, I don't know uh, what it will look like yet, but I do know that JobKeeper in its current form can end uh, without panicking the economy, without upsetting the economy and without panicking markets. The interest rate settings that we've got are, are extremely accommodative. We know Philip Lowe, from the Governor of the Reserve Bank, has said they're likely to remain here for the rest of his term, which takes it out another two or three years. Um, uh, the $100 billion bond buying that occurred a few weeks ago. Uh, I think we'll see that again uh, and we might even see it bigger. And the reason I say that is uh, Philip Lowe was grilled this week uh, in uh, by Parliament uh, asking why uh, he didn't make that uh, bond purchasing price bigger if he's not seeing any wage growth. Uh, you know, if, if wage infl if inflation's not an issue because wage growth isn't an issue, then make your bond purchasing uh, bigger. Uh, and put more money into the financial system uh, and get banks lending. 
So it's fair to say you've got a you've got a fairly strong outlook for um, for growth, economic growth this year in the Australian market, which hopefully then should flow on to um, to equity values. Yeah, I think. Well, it won't it won't flow directly to equity values. There's actually it's interesting. There's actually not a strong correlation between the economy and the stock market in any one year. Uh, in fact, it's there's, there's there's virtually zero relationship. You know, you have if you have a strong economy you'll get in the years that you've had a strong economy, you've had as many weak stock markets as you've had strong stock markets. So, so I don't think there's a, a direct relationship, but I do believe that there will be businesses that recover much stronger than the analysts than consensus currently estimates, and you'll do very well owning those businesses. I also think that um, with interest rates as low as they are, combined with the shackles being taken off the banks, on their lending, for example, a loosening of the Responsible Lending Act, um, uh, banks uh, being given uh, or seeing rather uh, a, a reduction in their non-performing loans, so people are now paying off their mortgages again, that will give the banks confidence to lend. Um, and we know, for example, that house prices, uh, the single biggest explanatory variable for house prices in the short and medium term is credit availability or credit access. So if you've got the banks willing to lend and the government telling them they can lend and house prices are going up, which incentivizes people to borrow, uh, then that's going to be a virtuous circle. Uh, and those increasing house prices will also help through the wealth effect to give confidence to consumers to spend even more than they've spent during the pandemic. And boy, did they spend during the pandemic. Yeah, well, that certainly makes sense there. I guess credit is, is, I've always viewed credit as the oil in the economy. So the more oil you put in, the um, faster the economy can move there. So I'm, I'm guessing from your comments there that you, the view on the federal government's fiscal response and also the RBA's mon monetary response to the crisis last year? Look, I think, I think they've done an admirable job. You've got to remember the context that they're operating in. Um, you, we had... A, we had what was arguably going to be a depression. Um, mm. uh, and, uh, and I think the government responded and the RBA responded very quickly. Um, the Reserve Bank of Australia is operating in an environment globally where everyone's employing quantitative easing. The RBA has kept their powder dry for a very long time, uh, which gave them huge flexibility when the crisis hit. Uh, and so, you know, they, they, they banked up a lot of credits uh, and they were able to use them, um, and I think they, you know, I think they can do more right now uh, than what they're already doing. Um, but what they're already doing is uh, is is seeing animal spirits return, uh, which is terrific. Uh, so I think the government have done a good job. I think the RBA is doing a, a fine job. Um, you know, there are critics. There's always critics, uh, but you've got to remember they're they're working in an uncertain environment. They're they're having to make decisions very quickly uh, without com a complete picture about what the future is going to look like. Mm. No, interesting. And I think I, I share your views there that the, um, the RBA certainly held off on any form of quantitative easing for a number of years. And naturally, then at the onset of the crisis, they had the powder there to be able to do, deploy some bond buying programs. Um, Correct. But Following on from my earlier comments on market valuations appearing high, there's a lot of talk about a bubble in equities. Yeah. Um, so can you tell us whether you think we're actually in a bubble and why? Yeah, the, the arguments, there's, I guess there's, there's two primary arguments for why, we're, why we might be in a bubble. Number one is the market is uh, overvalued uh, and, and many point to the Cape-Shiller ratio, which is the um, Robert Schiller's cyclically adjusted PE. Uh, it's over 35 times now, nearly 36 times. And the ratio has been back uh, reverse engineered to 1870. Uh, and so you go back 150 years, there's only one occasion where the ratio was higher than this. And that was during 1999, during the tech bubble. So investors point first to the market being overvalued as a reason why we're in a bubble. And the other thing that they point to a lot is these you know, quite quite frequent um, uh, instances of speculative uh, enthusiasm and, you know, these ridiculous price increases. So, for example, you know, last year, you know, you saw uh, Kodak um, 
what's another one? Nicola, which is the electric vehicle hopeful. Um, uh, there was, yeah, I mentioned Kodak. So Kodak, Nicola, uh, the Bitcoin price be years before that or a couple of years ago. Uh, you know, you see these 1,000, 2,000% price increases uh, and you're seeing a lot of that at the moment. There's a tidal wave of IPOs that are uh, the coming to market. That again is a sign that the market's very hot. Those PE, those a lot of those IPOs don't make any money, uh, and so their sh and their share prices are doubling on listing. Uh, and so again, anecdotal evidence of irrational behaviour or bubble-like behaviour. Uh, and so they're the two or three primary arguments for uh, for a bubble being in place. But but what I would say is that talking about the market first, so the market being expensive, you've got to remember 25% of the S&P 500 um, is five stocks. And those five stocks are Facebook, Amazon, Apple, Microsoft, and Google. Those five companies have economic characteristics or business characteristics that we've never seen in the business world before. They've got the most powerful economic moats any business has ever had. They've got the ability to raise prices without a detrimental impact to unit sales volume because they're monopolists. Um, they've got huge runways for growth. Uh, they've got incredible profitability because of their um, sustainable competitive advantages. Uh, their return on equity goes up as they get bigger. So they become more profitable as they get larger. So it's a little bit like having a bank account. Imagine you had a bank account, Paul, with a million dollars in it and it was earning 10%. And the bank said to you, look, Paul, if you can get that to 10 million, we'll give you 20% a year. If you can get it to 100 million, we'll give you 40% a year. You know, that's, that, that, that's an incredible asset. And, um, and that's what these companies have, these five companies. So while the overall market appears to be expensive, 25% of that market is driven by five companies that have the most awesome economics that we've ever seen in business ever before. Uh, and... That might be, look, that might be hobbled by antitrust action by the government, um, by Biden and, and the Democrats. Um, but, but at the moment, you know, there aren't many businesses like it. And so they deserve a premium. But they're surprisingly trading on PEs of 20, 30, 35 times. You know, they're not, they're not super expensive. Um, so the first argument, the market's expensive, as the PE uh, Cape Schiller ratio says, you know, you can... You can, you can argue that, uh, yeah, it looks expensive, but hey, let's look at the economics of these businesses. These aren't like the internet companies of 1999. The internet didn't have, the internet had 150 million users in 1999. Today, there's 150 million users in Indonesia. You know, so, so you've, got, you, you've got massive usage, you've got massive growth potential, you've got better infrastructure, you've got lower latency, better storage, more powerful servers and chips. You know, so these companies are really, are really leveraging that in a way they couldn't do during the first internet bubble. Uh, and so I don't think the stock market overall is in a bubble. I believe there are pockets of bubbles, um, but I don't believe you should infer from that that the entire market is in a bubble. The second argument is these individual bubbles. But as I mentioned a moment ago, you know, if you think about, you know, think about companies like Kodak or Hertz last year, or Nikola or Bitcoin between 2017 and 2018. You know, those three stocks, Nikola, Kodak and Hertz, they went up between 600% and 1600% last year in a couple of months. And then they, they collapsed. They fell by 90%, 85 to 90%. And the rest of the market just went on its merry way. So as long as the entire market isn't in a bubble, and as long as the assets that are in a bubble are not held on the balance sheets of systemically important financial institutions, then you're not going to get a market-wide crash and you're not going to get a financial crisis. And so these things can inflate and deflate without disrupting the rest of the market. Before we bring you the second part of this chat, a little bit about who we are. NetWealth is an ASX-listed company established to help Australians take control of their financial futures. With a wide range of super investment accounts, a huge variety of investment options and market-leading online tools, we can help you manage your wealth your way. Partner with us to see wealth differently and discover a brighter future. 
Visit the NetWealth website to learn more and get the PDS, which you should read before making a decision. Products issued by NetWealth Investments Limited. Yeah, interesting comments there, Roger. I guess in my mind, I think at times, are we right in the, the, the whole growth of the IT revolution where certain old business models and practices are dying? And we are seeing some companies that have been, you know, losing value on the stock market for probably 10 or 15 years. And on the other side of the coin, we are seeing the, you know, the FANG stocks that you spoke to in the US. And we're seeing, you know, small examples in Australia as well. So I think there's some structural changes going on behind the scenes that um, that I think we all need to think about cautiously as equity investors there. Um, I agree with that 100%. Yeah, yeah, it's, it is. It's interesting. And I think only economic historians will write about this period in another hundred years. But um, unfortunately, we won't be around probably to be able to sit back and muse on what we went through. No, but we can... <laughs> We can invest. We can invest in it now and take advantage yeah, of it and participate in that growth. You know, you were you were talking about you know, big structural changes in in IT. You you would remember as well as I do. It was only the big companies that had, um, you know, racks and racks of servers of big computing power and, uh, you know, and and it was only big companies that really could harness the internet even ten years ago. Um, today, the cloud has really democratized the internet. So even a small company can set up um, and, and start selling goods on the internet to people all around the world and have just-in-time delivery and so on. So, you know, it, it really is transforming business. It's upsetting some companies and it's disrupting some, but it's also creating, you know, a whole new world of opportunity that you can invest in. Yeah, fascinating. I mean, the other big asset class everyone's interested in, obviously in Australia, our national obsession being residential property. Um, I've read various articles on the outlook for residential property. Some people are predicting growth this year of between 10 and 30% in valuations, um, effectively based on record low home loan interest rates. So what do you think is going to happen to residential property this year in Australia? I'll just reiterate an article that I wrote for The Australian back in November 20, uh, and that is that 21 will be a very, very good year for property. Um, uh, simply because, as I mentioned a moment ago, you know, credit access is the most important variable for property prices, and access is being increased, uh, or, you know, restrictions are being loosened, um, the shackles are being taken off the banks, um, people are getting back to repaying down their mortgages. Um, they're not travelling overseas. When they travel overseas, Paul, every year Australians spend $42 billion. They actually spend $63 billion on overseas travel and expenditure while they're overseas, but 42 or $43 billion of that is leisure. So if you're not travelling overseas for leisure, that's an extra 42 or $43 billion you could be spending in Australia or putting on a mortgage. And with interest rates at record lows, you can borrow for four years fixed at the moment for 1.98%, I and mean, that's virtually free money. So, you know, I think, I think all the ducks are lined up for a very, very good year for property. I said that in The Australian back in November last year. Um, I bought, uh, we upgraded our property two weeks before the federal election in 2019. I thought, I thought Labor would lose. I know everyone else thought they would win and it would be a disaster for property. But even if Labor did win, you're owning property for more than three years, which is the election cycle in Australia. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I've, I've been relatively bullish property now since 2000, since the federal election. Uh, and I think this year it accelerates. Yeah, it's it. I mean, as an aside, I um, I have a keen interest in classic motor cars, and I've been astounded over the oh, last fantastic. twelve months how they've they've doubled, even some have tripled in value. Um, and I oh, think it's back to your a, point there. People Escort, aren't traveling. Oh yeah, the old Ford Escort, great little car there. But uh, yeah, it's amazing. Thirty thousand for an old Ford Escort. It's incredible. Yeah. yeah, and I, I guess they are becoming oh, viewed as a real asset there, but with interest rates. With people not spending the money on the family overseas holiday, the um, the money's been finding its way into other areas of the economy and property. Your, your comments make absolute sense, and as you were saying it, that's what I thought. I thought similar to uh, to the classic car market as well. So um, well, yeah. Well, you might remember this time last year when we to we talked. I talked about low interest rates spurring booms and bubbles in every asset class. So the same things happening 
in art, low digit number plates, stamps, coins, yeah. uh, wine, you name it. Where people have got, people are flush with cash, interest rates are low, uh, money is cheap and in abundant supply. So they go and fritter it on all sorts of things. Yeah, that's no, fascinating. Well, I, I could talk on about classic cars all afternoon, but we will get back oh, on we to do the... that. We could do that another time. <laughs> another when next time, time Roger. When, when next time in Melbourne, let's get up and talk about that because I've, I've got a, a fondness for collectible cars too. Yeah, fantastic, fantastic. Um, so moving back to the markets, and value stocks have underperformed growth stocks over the last decade, and there's been so much debate as to what has driven this, you know, whether it's record low interest rates, productivity gains from the IT revolution we mentioned. Um, there's two examples of potentially driving the outperformance of growth stocks. But despite value stocks performing well in the last quarter, 2020, and some people are saying, oh, are they starting to rebound? There continues to be that talk that value investing is dead. Um, and never have we seen such a gap between the growth and the value stocks. So what's your view on this debate? And um, do you think we will see the return of value stocks in the, in the medium to long term? I think the debate exists, Paul, because the definition of value investing is wrong. So... <clears throat> When, when all of the research that shows that value is underperformed growth, those, that research defines value as a low PE stock or a low price to book stock or a stock with a high yield. Most of those businesses are poor quality businesses. They don't have a lot of growth uh, and they're going to underperform companies uh, that are growing. Uh, and so what we've got to do is we've got to define, we've got to understand what value investing actually is. And I talk about it in, I talked about it in my book, Valuable. You want to buy a high quality company. You want to buy a business with powerful economics. You want to buy a business that generates high rates of return on equity and you want to buy it at a reasonable price. That doesn't mean it's got a low PE. For example, let's take a company on a PE of 30 times or 40 times earnings that's growing at 30% a year but the market has it growing at 20% a year. Um, so that's going to be cheap because when it continues to display 30% growth per year, the market's going to revalue that stock up. It's going to reappraise an appropriate PE for that stock. And, and as the market swings from being too conservative to being really optimistic about its prospects, the PE is going to expand and a PE of 40 is going to look cheap. And it's the same, then you think about the business, the FANG stocks, for example, you know, you know, paying 26 times earnings or 40 times earnings for Facebook or Apple five years ago was a bargain. Um, what these businesses demonstrate is the ability to grow faster than people are able to estimate. And so growth and value are two sides of the same coin. What you want to do is buy a company that can grow. And I've always advocated buying businesses that are going to be bigger than they are today in the future. Um, and you just want to buy them at a reasonable price. So we have to redefine what value is. And there's a lot of different ways to define value. The problem with the debate raging about value versus growth is it's a very narrow de definition of what value is. And it's usually what they're saying is, the, the, you know, the, the, the old conventional companies with no growth, they're not outperforming the companies with growth. Well, of course, it's a little bit like asking a, a, a Volkswagen Combi to race a Ferrari uh, in, in, on a track uh, and expect the Volkswagen to win. You know, only if the Ferrari crashes is the Volkswagen going to win. It doesn't matter how many times they race each other. And going back to the textbook definitions of value, that why can't companies growing strong? And I know over my career of companies that have grown strong that have been very reasonably priced and they look to be great value. And I've thought, you know, isn't that value as well? So it's, it's really interesting your insights there about starting with what is the actual definition of a value stock. Um, and I think, um, yeah, you've provided some really, really interesting insights there I was just going to add, Paul, sorry, with a bit of a delay between um, your, your phone and mine. Um, if, if an investor finds a company that looks expensive today, but it's going to grow much, much faster 
than what the consensus currently estimates growth to be, it will end up looking cheap uh, in the future when you look back to today. So it's important not only to think of value as you know, a price cheaper than its intrinsic value, but also to think if the company can grow much faster than what's expected, um, it's going to produce an outcome that will make an expensive price today actually look cheap when you get go forward in time. Mm, yeah. Um, turning back to the Australian economy, and we mentioned earlier about the RBA's round two of quantitative easing with the 100 billion bond buying program. Um, how long do you think Aussie interest rates are going to remain low? And also, what do you think will likely lead to a spike in inflation that would then obviously flow on to an increase in interest rates? Philip Lowe has said rates are going to stay low for the rest of his term. So they're probably going to stay here. You know, he's probably not going to increase rates again. So that's so rates of zero short term or overnight cash rate of 0.1% uh, for another two to three years. Uh, that's hard to accept. Uh, and people will speculate that it won't last that long, but that's the current view. Um, what I would be watching out for are two things. Uh, I'd be watching out for a steepening of the yield curve. So if bond rates start to go up, uh, and the yield curve steepens, that would be a negative for asset prices. And then as a possible catalyst for that, I'd be watching wage growth. If wage growth starts to go up uh, or starts to accelerate, uh, that, that's going to take some time to feed through, uh, but the bond yield curve will start steepening. So uh, yeah, they're the two things I would keep an eye out for. Uh, but at the moment, my answer to your question is, I don't see any reason um, for short-term interest rates to go up uh, for the next year or two. Yeah, and I think yeah, the examples of what we've seen in, in like the US and what have you, um, yeah, we've never seen any great rises in interest rates over the last decade there. Um, so yeah, I'm with you that I think over the we're going to be um, in a in an environment of low interest rates there, um, with equity valuations high and bond returns at all times low, at all time lows. Where are the best places do you think to invest across Australian asset classes? Yeah, I think um, it's a good question to finish up on. I think there are three or four themes uh, that make a lot of sense to me. Um, the first one is uh, probably. Um, the reopening of the economy uh, and there's going to be what we call a mix shift so so that you know during the pandemic when everyone was locked down at home they spent money on goods but what's going to happen we think is that there's going to be an increasing proportion of spending on services so people couldn't go to the cinema they couldn't go to a concert they couldn't go to they couldn't travel uh, you know they were spending just getting stuff delivered home. Um, I think as the economy reopens, we'll see a shift towards spending on services more. Um, we'll also see companies benefit from the reopening itself. So, you know, that, and take advantage of that cyclicality. So businesses like Alliance Airways, for example, is going to do well. I think IDP education as foreign students return to universities in Australia after they've been vaccinated. Um, Ingenia communities, I think, will do well as people travel. You know, they own caravan parks. Um, you know, we, we've seen you, you can't book you can't book a holiday home uh, if you if you don't own one. It's very very hard to book one in some of the more desirable holiday destinations in Australia. So you're going to see you know more of that uh, more revenue accrue to companies that are providing services and benefiting from a reopening. That's the first one. The second one we saw accelerate during the pandemic, but uh, it's got really, really, a really long runway for growth. And that's that's cloud computing and technology and communications. So during the pandemic, more people uh, running conferences on Zoom and, and Teams and FaceTiming, uh, more people downloading music and streaming video, movies and so on. Um, so that, that saw an increasing demand uh, from the cloud or it can, can we see, increasing demand of the cloud, but cloud penetration is 22%. It's where mobile phones were 12 years ago, or laptops were 18 years ago. Um, you know, it really is 
uh, really just at its nascent stage and the and cloud has a long, long runway for growth. So we think businesses like uh, Macquarie Telecom and Next DC are going to do well for years and years um, as they develop out their footprint. Uh, and, and you know, and then another you know, on the technology, sorry, the telecommunication side, company like Unity Group, um, you know, MyNet Phone, Spark, those sorts of businesses, I think they'll do really well. Um, they'll do really well just by virtue of who's running them and the consolidation opportunity that's in front of them. Um, Unity Group, for example, is run by Vaughan Bowen, who used to uh, Bowen, who used to run M2, um, and uh, and of course everyone made a lot of money out of M2. Um, and then when the when the um, pandemic is over, uh, when everyone's been inoculated um, or vaccinated, I think we'll be able to we'll have the luxury of being able to think about other world problems, and one of those problems will be the environment. And so that's going to happen at the same time that we've reached a tipping point for electric vehicles uh, or hydrogen vehicles. And so you know, we know California, for example, the state of California, which is the biggest passenger car market in the United States, the United States being the biggest passenger car market in the world, they basically said within 10 years, I think it's less than that, in fact, they don't want any passenger cars sold uh, with emissions. So they want all cars sold to have new cars to have zero emissions. So that means every car manufacturer in the world is going to retool to manufacture electric cars. There is currently an oversupply of lithium for batteries, but that will be soaked up very quick after the tipping point for the manufacturing of electric vehicles. And so I think when the pa when the pandemic is over, we're going to see uh, renewed conversations about electric vehicles. Investors are going to realise the tipping point's been reached. The lithium price is going to go up. So businesses like, uh, you know, lithium and rare earths as well, by the way. So businesses like Mineral Resources or a Cobra and Linus, uh, I think, you know, they're going to benefit from that shift. Uh, and they've already, their share prices have already done really well. Uh, but I think there's probably more to go. And then the final theme, which, um, you know, I'm sorry for taking up so much of your time, Paul. But the final theme is income. Uh, you know, I think income is going to be a really... Uh, important thing this year, uh, more so than in any previous year. And what we're going to see is we're going to see a lot of uh, pension funds and a lot of super funds around the world uh, bidding for assets that demonstrate uh, reliable annuity style income streams. Uh, and so I think I think you want to own some of the REITs, for example, like National Storage or the Waypoint REIT. Uh, you know, I think they're going to do pretty well because of their income. Uh, but I also think you're going to see a lot of mergers and acquisitions activity in businesses that are already producing annuity style income or have the potential to do so, like Macquarie Telecom, for example. Macquarie Telecom, we talked about a moment ago, it's going to own a network of cloud storage data centers. But once they're fully developed and they're fully tenanted and you know the ATO is in there and the stock exchange is in there and, you know, all of the big companies are using their services and they've got full occupancy, well, that's just going to throw off cash every year as an income stream. And, and there'll be pension funds that want to buy those income streams. So they're the sort of businesses that we think might come into play over the next 12 months uh, as, as um, a, lot of these, uh, a lot of these very flush with cash pension funds sharpen their pencils and decide how they're going to deliver better returns to their clients. Yeah, well, you've certainly rationally articulated, you know, a number of exciting investment opportunities we can look forward to going forward. But I guess the key point also is that it certainly pays to think about having active stock selection and active management in your portfolios there. So um, at that point, Roger, we will leave it. I, will, I wish to thank you very much for joining us again at uh, the Net Wealth Portfolio Construction Podcast. I wish you and all of the staff at Montgomery the best for 2021 and certainly to the listeners, thank you for joining us again and I certainly hope 2021 is a, a better and more positive year than what we've experienced in 2020 and I look forward to joining you on the next instalment of the NetWealth Portfolio Construction podcast series. Thank you all. Thanks for listening to this episode of the NetWealth Portfolio Construction podcast series. 
For more episodes and to subscribe to our series, visit our website www.netwealth.com.au or visit the iTunes Store or Spotify. We hope you can tune into our next episode. Thank you.